Good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from Chiang Mai. I am Kudia Kaviwong, curator of the exhibition People, Victory, Life After the War, which I co-curated with some of your friends from uh, MRC International School as well as the Renaissance. I would like to welcome you to the second edition of our online lecture series, a public program of the two chapters exhibition of modern and contemporary art from and about Vietnam from the Nguyen Art Foundation. I'm really happy and honored to host the lecture by the most important and internationally known young contemporary artist, Phan Thao Nguyen. Thao Nguyen, born in 1987 in Vietnam. Her work explores ambitious issues in social conventions history and tradition through her practice that includes observations through literature, philosophy, and daily life. Tao Nguyen graduated with honors from the LaSalle College of the Arts in Singapore in 2009 before receiving her MFA in painting and drawing from the School of, of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2013. She is a co-founder of the collective Art Labels with artist Chen Kung Tum and curator Alet Quinn An Chen. Tao Nguyen is a 2016 and 17 Rolex protege and has exhibited widely in Southeast Asia, Asia, and more recently internationally in Europe. Ban Tao Nguyen is known for her practice as a poetic multi-layers artworks, which explore the historical and ecological issues facing Vietnam while speaking to universal ideas surrounding tradition, ideology, rituals, and environmental change through storytelling, mixing official and unofficial histories. Her work challenges what she described as political amnesia. Today, Tao Nguyen will share with us her artistic practice and educational experiences, which may be helpful for some of you who wanted to study art and design in the future. The title of her talk today is Star of Bar, Closer Fires Flies, an excerpt from a poem by Kung Kung, who was born from 1828, sorry, 1928 to 1997, and translated by Tai Ha. In this talk, Tao Nguyen will bring together a selection of her artworks, including video, paintings, and sculpture. And she will also share her personal reflections on the development of the contemporary art in Ho Chi Minh City, her education at the Ho Chi Minh Fine Arts University, and her learning from the local alternative art spaces, as well as her experience exhibiting abroad. So I hope that you will enjoy this lecture. And if you have questions, please write down in Facebook so the artist will answer your question after her presentation. Last but not least, I would like to remind those of you who didn't have a chance to visit both chapters to go and see the exhibitions at Wan Phuc and Nam Long campus. So as for, the, as for the public programs, we will have more lectures every month. So please stay tuned for our updates. And again, thank you for attending this talk. The floor is yours, Ban Tao Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like first uh, to thank you, the Wing Art Foundation, and uh, the curator, Kritia, and also the students at uh, MRC, um, who uh, co collectively and very creatively has created this uh, exhibition. People, Victory and Life After the War that uh, include one of my work in the exhibition. And uh, in this uh, lecture today, um, I would like to explore a little bit uh, my journey of uh, being a visual artist in Vietnam, uh, my education at the Fire Art University in Ho Chi Minh City, and then my education in Chicago. Uh, and then when I came back to Vietnam and uh, started to um, participate in the contemporary art scenes and uh, started to exhibit um, more uh, locally and also internationally. Um, so the title of the talk 
Uh, it's called Star of Faras, Closer Fireflies. Uh, it is a rough translation of uh, uh, two sentences from a poetry by one of the poets that I really love. His name is Hung Kung, and his poetry, uh, he is quite known for his involvement uh, with the movement, the literary movement um, in the north in the 50s. It's called Nhân Văn Giai Phẩm. And then he was not allowed to publish his works for decades, uh, but now his work are allowed to publish again. And I have a particular um, interest and relation to his poetry. So in this uh, talk, I would like to borrow his uh, poem as a title of my talk. So um, I think I would like to share among um, my first experience, experience with contemporary art um, in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, it's uh, an alternative art space that was run by two uh, artists. One is the Vietnamese French artist uh, Sandrine Luque, and the other is her partner, a French artist named Metran Perret. And they opened an art space um, uh, in their apartment. Uh, their apartment was on Nguyen Trai Street, uh, a busy street in Saigon, but it's a very own apartment and very uh, modest apartment. And they, uh, among the group of Vietnamese overseas artists that came back to Vietnam in the mid 2000s. So this space was in 2006 when I was the first year student at the Far Arts University. And they came back to Vietnam, and at that time, Sun Green has the first solo show uh, at Queen Gallery. At that time, Queen Gallery is still located at Little Drop Street, a much smaller space than it is today. And I came to see her exhibition, and I was so inspired by her uh, video works and her installation, and also her line drawings. And then she invited me uh, that she say she opened a small art space in her apartment. And every week there would be some uh, events, uh, weekly events just for one day, um, that she introduced uh, international artists um, to Vietnamese audience and also uh, have some um, uh, artworks and intervention from Vietnamese artists. Um, so in this particular slide, uh, I show one of the videos that I particularly intrigued um, that was a showcase of uh, Bruce Norman's um, stamping in the studio. So Bruce Norman is known as one of the uh, very important um, American conceptual artists. And I didn't know his artwork at all. As a first year student in Vietnam, I never heard of him. Um, so when I came in the space, it's just so minimal. It's just one uh, small monitor screen like this showing Bruce Norman walking, stamping around his studio space. And, uh, and then the Far Art University students who came with me to the apartment, which is like friends and which is, oh, let's go there. There's a group of uh, overseas artists that's quite interesting. Uh, so we came there and then we see this video and um, most of my friends think that this work is a bit ridiculous. It's just like the artist walking around the studio doing nothing in a loop. But for me it was particularly uh, intrigued because it's so different from what I was learning in the art school at the time. So, uh, talk a bit more about uh, the art space of Sun Green and Betran. Its name is Atelier Wonderful, and it ran for five months in 2006. And there's some other archival images from the space. And you can see that um, there are gatherings and there are also showcases of artists that now um, quite established such as uh, Bùi Công Khánh, or conversation with artists like uh, Jun Nguyễn Hatsushiba or uh, Richard Chun. And 
the, the top um, picture, there's also an event um, that bring uh, graffiti to the white cube, kind of. And I was there in one of the people who was doing the wall painting. Um, so I would like to show these uh, images. These are not my work, but to illustrate the differences between the curriculum in the Far Art School in Ho Chi Minh City and the alternative art scenes that is happening outside of the academy. Um, so to enter the art school uh, at that time is quite difficult. Like you have to really um, study well in academic drawings, like you have to do live drawings for four hours per day and to do the entrance test to the Fire Art University is considered very challenging. So inside the uh, Fire Art University, there are mainly uh, curriculums such as uh, live drawing sessions, um, composition and decoration. And one of the things that I'm intrigued the most getting from the art school is the field trips. So um, from my assumption, the field trips uh, begins during the colonial period with the uh, Echo de Buza, the colonial art school in Hanoi, where um, artists like, for example, uh, Tong Ngoc Vân, uh, one of the most well-known painter during this, this period. This sketch he produced when he was a student and uh, the um, professors will send the student out to the street or to the countryside to do live sketches of the life of the people um, in, the, in their daily life. And this practice cap continues even nowadays uh, these are uh, on the further side is the sketches of the students that one of the professors in the Far Art University, Mr. Nguyen Quang Vinh, he took of his uh, works of his students. Um, so even nowadays, the school asks the students to go out of the classroom and do live sketches and painting and drawings. Um, and uh, for in comparison, you could see that there is a transition from um, the practice of doing live drawings or sketches outside um, from the colonial school to um, the curriculum nowadays, which is um, still very traditional, but somehow for me it also has a new influence of um, social realism and also the, the ideology of um, um, artists as um, shoulders. So um, the artists are supposed to be sent to um, kind of the battlefield is life. So the students are sent to the countryside to depict life of the people uh, working there. For example, in 2008, um, I went to Hazan province, which is in up north of Vietnam, very close to China, to uh, live there for one month in a local house and to depict the life of the local people there. And also, I participated in a campaign. It's called Green Summer. In Vietnamese, it's called Mùa Hè Sun, uh, which um, assumed to uh, gather Vietnamese uh, uh, students um, to the countryside to do classes uh, for the kids or uh, to participate in. Uh, farming activities or help local people to build houses. So those are the way that I gather experience from the art school. And um, to mention uh, the first time that I 
met the curator of our show, Miss Krithia, uh, uh, was at a very important event for me personally. Uh, it's called Saigon Open City. Um, if I remember correctly, it's in 2006-2007, where um, um, artists uh, like uh, Mr. Dean Kule and uh, curators like Miss uh, Krithia and Mr. Krikrit uh, Tiravanit came to Vietnam and planned to have um, Saigon, kind of a Saigon Biennale, but then they kind of changed it to Saigon Open City. And uh, from my experience, um, I think the organizers of the event felt that this particular event, Saigon Open City, was not very successful because at that time, maybe the city was not ready for a Biennale like that. And many of the exhibitions, uh, even um, works from very internationally well-known artists, was um, not allowed to be uh, uh, publicly exhibited. Uh, but for me as a student, it was a very important experience. Uh, that was the first time I have a little bit of sense of how the artwork look like internationally. And uh, inside Saigon Open City, there are also col collaborate events uh, as the Fire Art uh, Association, uh, such as uh, like an exhibition that I participated, it's called Recovery. Um, uh, and in this exhibition, you can see that some artists um, that are still very active now, like Nguyễn Phương Linh or Lại Thị Diệu Hà. And um, also, uh, during this time is when I um, started to know an art space in Hanoi uh, that is for me extremely important. It's called Nhà San. And Nyasan, uh, at that time, is still at the uh, house of uh, Mr. Nguyễn Mạnh Đức. It was a still house uh, that uh, by the Moon Ethnic that was brought to the capital city of Hanoi. And it became a very experimental art space. And I came to Nyasan for the first time for a performance art event for students. It's called Dam Dam. And it was curated by uh, Trần Lương, who was uh, very active uh, as an organizer of Nhà San at that time. Um, and uh, further on, um, I started to get more involved in performance. And uh, I would like to mention this uh, particular uh, exhibition. Um, in Singapore, it was organized by the Singapore Art Museum. Uh, it's called Post Doi Mới, um, Vietnamese art after 1990. And of course, many people are aware that after 1986, um, the renovation period in Vietnam has changed a lot of the faces of the country, such as an open economy and also an open art market. So in this exhibition, the list of the artists are many of them are painters and uh, who become known internationally after the renovation period. But also there is a side little small event that focuses on performance. And this smaller event um, is also uh, organized by Trần Lun and it, br it brings groups of very young artists from Vietnam, including me, um, to Singapore to do performance. And uh, during this event that I got to know artists like Lee Wen, who uh, passed away recently, very important Singaporean artist uh, who works uh, critically um, involved with uh, politics and also identity. Um, so uh, this is a documentation of the performance piece that I did for Get Note event in Singapore. 
uh, this uh, event, uh, this particular uh, performance happened inside a campus at, at SMU University, like Singapore Management University, uh, just opposite the Singapore Art Museums. So uh, I, um, uh, at that time, I wo my work was very visceral and I work with materials that is very tactile and has a sense of touch, like raw meat. So in this uh, particular um, performance, I, um, I put materials that doesn't have a solid shape, like pork meat into the glass cubes and arrange it into a cube like a kind of a minimalist sculpture and in the end I kind of broke it by putting them on the escalator so the escalator kind of clashes the cubes um, and that was the end of the performance and this was the last performance I did. Um, so uh, after two or three years experimenting with many different mediums, I realized that I, for me um, to be trained as a painter in the art school, there is still something that is so relevant. So um, I consider these um, uh, my first important groups of paintings that I feel um, my maturity as a visual artist. Um, this group of painting is called Looking Down series and these are very small paintings that is painted on x-ray film backings and the, uh, the materials is interesting for me. It was given by my friend uh, Miss Alette Quinn Antron who, uh, who has parents working as doctors so they have these backing as leftovers. So when the patients take the actual x-ray away, this is the backing of the x-ray. So she gave it to me and I was experimenting with making work with them and I feel like painting on, on them could be a relevant um, uh, way of expressing my, expressing my interest in the foul object. Um, so in the series, uh, basically uh, it's a kind of uh, repetition of figurative uh, painting that depicting human looking down. And um, this series started when I was in the residency uh, at uh, San Art Lab. Uh, San Art uh, Lab uh, was also a very important residency program that nurture artists um, who have wants to explore a research-based practice and um, it ran uh, for a few years and then it stopped and then it also has another um, reincarnation as a um, AFAM which is also extremely interesting uh, and nurturing. So during uh, this um, residency, I was particularly intrigued in um, a kind of forgotten history, or not entirely forgotten, but rarely mentioned history of the Vietnam famine in um, 1945, uh, in which uh, people believe that uh, two million Vietnamese people died because of hunger in the north of Vietnam during the Japanese occupation. So because of the official textbook or official history doesn't articulate this particular event in a very um, open manner, I kind of have to do my own research and I uh, couldn't really find uh, relevant images or resources inside Vietnam. So when I um, came to Singapore uh, uh, for an exhibition, then I came to visit the um, memories of Old Ford Factory where the Singapore, uh, where the British 
signed the treaty to surrender to the Japanese. So the Japanese took over Malaya. Um, and at that time, it was a very difficult period where the local people are suffering and they kind of have to bow to, to, bow to the imperial, superior, um, as an archive photograph that shows. And um, from the original archive photographs, I have removed the content, like remove the historical content, just focus on the medium of painting, on color, on composition, on the figure looking down. So the piece become completely ambiguous, remove all of the historical content, and it just become the basic act of looking down. Um, so, uh, because this video is a part of, uh, it has a relationship to the series of painting, and I also have a short clip, uh, maybe we can show it. Tối hôm 23 tháng chạp cái lâm ý mẹ tôi đã chết Tết thì vợ tôi là Nguyễn Thị Nhung cũng đẻ được một đứa con trai nên ba tuổi thì mấy con tôi chết trước vài hôm đây là bà vợ tôi đã chết theo thế là bốn đến tháng giêng ăn tết xong tháng giêng ông phấn ông nguyễn khắc phấn là anh 12 tháng giêng ông ấy lại chết vì không có thuốc hay sao không có thuốc mờ tôi sờ vào người ông vẫn nóng mờ chết mềm yếu như cái dưa đến lúc tiền không có tiền không có mua áo qua So um, it is a three-channel video installation, but for the purpose of uh, online viewing, so I put a footage from one of the channel. Um, so the uh, video is called Meet Brain, and it was, it is my uh, uh, kind of um, fictionalized and uh, my own imagination of exploring this particular history and um, it was for me extremely difficult to talk about this and I didn't know a way to do it well so during my research my own way of working is artistic research in which when I dive into a project I would try to uh, gather information uh, it could be factful information or it could be fictional so in order to explore this particular event, I, of course, uh, most people know this uh, event through the very iconic photographs of uh, photographer Võ An Ninh. But then I also um, came, come across the oral recordings of the famine victims. And these oral recordings was uh, recorded by the cassette uh, in um, 1994, 1995, and this was recorded by uh, uh, a group of historians that was led by uh, Professor Van Tao, who was the head of the History Institute in Hanoi. So this one, uh, this picture, this picture, uh, I came to his apartment in Hanoi, uh, and I asked him if he can grant me the use of these oral recordings for my research. Um, so he said that he uh, donated these recordings to the uh, 
Bảo tàng lịch sử Việt Nam, The History, uh, the uh, Museum of History in Hanoi. Um, so I collected the materials there, and in the videos I used the um, oral recordings of these um, victims. At that time, they already very old in their 70s because uh, the famine happened in the 40s, and then the recording was did in the uh, 19, uh, 1994-1995 um, and um, it was very interesting for me listening to the recording because they not only talk about the event of the famine itself but um, because the people are already quite old they have started to share their other experience through the revolutionary period, the red land reformation period, and even the bao cup period, like the subsidized period. Um, and then I selected uh, sequences from these oral recordings to create a script that was then reenacted by children actors who doesn't have any experience of this event. And uh, for example, uh, during uh, exhibitions, um, unfortunately, this uh, particular piece hasn't been shown uh, officially in Vietnam, but I brought it to uh, other places. For example, in this iteration, in um, Dhaka Art Submit in Bangladesh last year, uh, the video was shown together with a group of uh, sketches by a Bengali uh, artist um, like uh, Zainun Abedin or Samnat Hor, who later became very well-known modernist artist of Bangladesh. And at that time, in, during the 40s in, uh, in Bengal, there was the Bengal famine of 1943, which was very devastating. And the artist there came out of the street to depict the, the tragedy of this event, but I couldn't find any uh, similar uh, depiction in Vietnam by Vietnamese artists except from Võ An Ninh. So for me, it's an interesting comparison by artists that seem so far away in, East, uh, in South Asia compared to an event to Vietnam to see that these are um, events that universal. And then uh, together with the with the three video installation, I also created a group of uh, paintings. Uh, it's called Dream of March and August. Um, in Vietnam it's uh, say Jim Bao Than Ba Mu Tam. So uh, I, I took from a kind of own saying, say that in March and August, it means uh, the poorest month of the lunar calendar. Because in Vietnam, we used to have a kind of two seasons for rice cultivation, uh, uh, winter, spring, and summer, autumn. So at March, at the end of the uh, autumn, uh, at the Winter is when the rice ran out, the same like August. So I invent uh, two characters. They are siblings. Uh, they name March and August, and they are the characters that suffer the famine. And one of them, August, passed away, and she became a ghost because she died of unjustified death. So she cannot uh, reincarnate to another life. So she can't wander in this life and become like a ghost. And these um, paintings are uh, depiction of uh, a deep teach where the two siblings, they kind of sitting next to each other, uh, but they cannot meet each other because they are in different, different life. And they also, um, the depiction of the painting for me are uh, very cheerful, very romanticized. When people look at them, they would think more of uh, prosperity or happiness, not about tragedy. Mm -hmm. 
and these are the way that I display the paintings. That they always come in pairs, and instead of hanging them on the wall like a traditional painting, I have a create. Uh, I have create a painting installation where the silk painting, because of the particular materiality of silk, that is the see through. So when you display the painting. The front and the back of the painting could be seen together when you walk around the painting installation. And um, the series was first show at Asaja Binale um, in 2019 that was curated by Zoe Butt. And then it travels to other places like Shanghai or to Belgium. And then to accompany the, the painting and the video, for example, you could see that the video are behind this curtain and the painting are in front of this curtain. So when you enter the exhibition room, you first you see kind of pretty romantic paintings depicting happy children. And then you have to pass through this curtain that was uh, created by a uh, Rajput stock. Uh, the materials that uh, I also reference. One of the saying that was left after the famine period is called nhổ lút trong đáy. It means that um, it's assumption that the occupiers would force Vietnamese farmers to uproot their rice to grow chut. And this installation has a sound element, so maybe we can play a small video to hear the sound element of the installation. is a kind of grow to make the fiber and this fiber when they finish the harvest is usually taken out of the stalk so the stalk of the two plants become formula bones it doesn't have flesh it doesn't have um, a fiber around them it just become bare bones and when people pass through this installation it's great sound like inside of the two field um, and it's very minimal, it doesn't have any kind of narrative element to this action. Um, so uh, to have, um, to go forward to another work that I um, make also in relation to my interest to, of the unexplored and uh, unofficial history of uh, Vietnam. For example, this piece is called uh, Magical Bow Lacquer Tam. And I show this piece for the first time in um, Lyon Binale in France in 2019. And um, uh, for this particular work, I was very interested in a detail that I read in a book um, about a Vietnamese painter. Her name is uh, um, a Vietnamese silk painter. Her name is Letty Lu. And then uh, in her book, uh, there was conversation of her peers like uh, Le Phổ or Mai Thư. Uh, Vũ Cao Đàm, who shared the experience living in France at the time in the, 90, uh, in the 20s and in the 30s. And uh, there, in the conversation, there is a very small detail that doesn't relate to their work at all. But they say that uh, Vietnamese uh, locker artisans were sent to France as uh, um, workers uh, to, pr to put locker on airplane propellers and then these airplane propellers was a uh, kind of uh, active participation in the World War, World War I. Uh, and then because after that, when the aviation industry developed, uh, the propeller of airplanes transformed from wood into metal, then this uh, practice was abandoned. Uh, so in this uh, particular uh, image at the bottom, you could see that there is an archive of the Vietnamese uh, lacquer 
workers in France put um, Vietnamese lacquer on a French propeller. So in this um, installation, I borrow a French uh, propeller that pro produced that in that period. Uh, it was produced uh, by a company, it's called Tonkin Lacquer. And basically the lacquer was applied on the propeller uh, with Vietnamese lacquer. And then I have uh, the, the propeller installed, it was rotating and then below it there is a painting that kind of uh, produced by the silk that was weaved in Lyon. Uh, the city was well known for its silk industry. Um, depict the relationship between um, uh, coloniality and uh, my imagination of uh, the event. And um, surrounded the installation, there are uh, lacquer crossbows. And these uh, crossbows are, uh, for me, a kind of um, a symbolic references to another source that I uh, collected in the Jesuit archive in, in Rome. Um, so uh, basically, uh, Yes, the document on this side is a letter by um, a Vietnamese catechist. Uh, his name is Bento Thien. And during the 17th century, he was among the first Vietnamese who studied the Romanized script. And he wrote this uh, short history of Vietnam that not really history, but mainly folk tales. And in this letter that he sent to his superior in in Rome, um, he write in Vietnamese Romanized script, and there is a story of Sơn Tinh Thủy Tinh, and also the story of Chuyện uh, Nhỏ Thần, which is the magical bow. That is a very well known story about the relationship of Vietnam and China, about betrayal and the love. Um, the love of uh, a Vietnamese princess and a Chinese prince that ends up in tragedy and it's all condensed in the symbol of the bow. So uh, for me it was kind of so interesting to see these uh, um, like a Vietnamese uh, Catholic write a letter in Romanized script sent to Italy and then in the letter there is a story about love between um, a princess in Vietnam and a prince in China and then how it becomes a tragedy. And for me this piece is so complex and open-ended because I keep expanded it and altered it in different versions when I anytime I exhibit it. So for this uh, version that I uh, exhibited this year uh, at the Factory Contemporary Art Center, um, uh, it was a sculpture show that curated by Bill Nguyễn and Vân Đỗ. And in this uh, iteration, I combined the painting, the crossbows, with another artistic preference of the work of Vietnamese modernist artist uh, Dim Phum Thi. Uh, which for me personally is my favorite sculptor ever. Uh, she uh, is well known for her intervention of using um, seven shapes that uh, she considered her alphabet to create the, um, the many different variations using many different materials uh, to create um, sculptures. And because her relationship to language also have a kind of, I have the same feeling of using the language. Um, so I, ha I, I feel that to have a conversation with her is to have a conversation between a younger person who also interested in language uh, as a political and critical form and her relationship to the shape as language as more like a poor modernist artistic form. And then interestingly, the end of the reincarnation of the work, this is one of the models of the wall that I designed 
uh, preferences one of the shapes of the phong thủy works. Uh, so in the exhibition, I use this shape as a wall to hang the uh, the drawings and the sculpture of the phong thủy on it. And in the end, you know, like at the end of every exhibition, somehow it wasteful because you have to demolish all of the walls and then you have to tear away the screen. It's very echo unfriendly. So um, the curator of the exhibition proposed that we bring this wall to the to the field. This is in Bình Quế, a, a kind of peninsula where there's so still presents rice paddies. When I came there, I still see farmers working on their rice paddies. That's so interesting. But of course, these land would soon be uh, sacrificed for um, urban development. So these are kind of, of course, it would be gone. But for me, it's like a new reincarnation to the artwork. And then, um, uh, Further, the interest in language and symbol um, for this um, scene, this is sourced from internet, this is not my work, but uh, I also very intrigued by the carved kind of decoration that was, uh, that, it, uh, that is displayed um, in Vietnam during New Year or during the five years party congress. Uh, symbolism like uh, the sunflowers or the dove, as a ideology or peace and happiness. Mm, for me, it's very interesting because it's like a kind of a continuation of the tradition of propaganda painting, but now they transform into a more contemporary practice, such as the LED lights display. And of course, it is sponsored by bigger uh, capital capitalist investments, such as the bank, for example. And uh, in one of my work, I pick up one of the um, uh, one of the light elements that was left over when they finished the decoration. Um, these are kind of uh, abandoned or they sold very cheaply. So I collect them and I transform them into sculptures and also into um, props for videos. So for example, in this particular piece, it's called the rice. I, I pick up the dove shape that um, was left after the celebration, the decoration on the street, and then I manipulated them by putting uh, white chalk on them. So it become more obscure, and it's become a very abstract light piece. And on the right side, you could see that uh, this bird, when they First, they pick up on the street, then they become an element in the video piece, and in the end, they become an artwork in its own right. Um, and uh, I also have a very um, deep interest in um, environmental issues and also issues around the Mekong River. And uh, my, con my interest in the Mekong River started in uh, 2012, when I was invited by the Goethe Institute to do um, an exhibition called Riverscape in Flux, and at that time, the issue of the Mekong River already become a debatable topic. But then I kind of have, I kind of kept this interest until uh, last year, 2000, uh, until 2019, when I finally got the grant to produce the work that I want. Um, so uh, I make a video, it's called Becoming Alluvium. So in this video, it's borrow the, the writing from uh, uh, Marguerite Duras, who was, of course, a very well-known French writer who grew up in the Mekong Delta and who write very beautiful but also romanticized novels about the life in the Mekong. And uh, to pair with the folklore from this folklore from Cambodia about a princess who um, vainly wanted to have a jewelry made from morning dew. 
and in the end it become impossible and she become a deal herself and then she evaporated into the Mekong River and uh, I usually when I work on the video I like to bring the animation elements so uh, you can see one shot in my studio I make a whole bunch of uh, watercolor drawings and then I would apply it into this side which is a video skew and then I also show this piece um, uh, for the first time in John Miro Foundation in Barcelona in 2019 and then it goes to um, an exhibition in Wheels in Brussels in 2022 uh, in 2020 so maybe we can have a short clip from this uh, video piece as video number three But uh, it is a very short uh, um, excerpt from the video in which I work with animation. And the anima animation is created by my own watercolor drawings on top of um, colonial engravings by a French artist named Louis de la Pote, who, uh, who with the Mekong Exploration Commission that composed by a group of only men, white men, um, that travel from Saigon down to Cambodia where they discover and so admire uh, Angkor Wat and then they go upstream to Thailand, Burma and they ended in Yunnan in China but never reach the source of the Mekong. So I use the engravings of one of the artists in this group and I can overlay it with my own interpretation of this, this subject matter. And then accompany the video is a series of ongoing paintings. It's called Perpetual Brightness. And in this series of painting, I also continue to explore the reality of painting as a sculpture that I already explored in Dream of March and August. So uh, these are standing panels. One side of the panels are lacquer painting, a kind of a loose depiction of the map of the Mekong River. And on the, the other side is the on the other side is the silk panels that I painted um, kind of alle allegorical um, narrative of my own interpretation of what's going on in the Mekong River. Uh, for example, in the lower panels, I kind of have a depiction of the boy holding a whale and then he's kind of mourning for the pass away of the whale and this kind of reference uh, a practice uh, of the of the fishermen on the coast of Vietnam uh, from the south to the middle of the country like in Ha Tinh to, uh, to Nha Trang to Bình Thuận where the fishermen when they see a, a whale that is stranded on the ground they would um, First, they try to save the whale, and if, if not successful, they would bury the whale, make a ceremony, and then they would kind of worship, worship the whale like a god. And for me, this is a kind of very beautiful practice that shows the relationship between how humans depend on nature, for example, depends on the ocean, but they also show a respect to the animals there. So it's not a kind of 
just exploitation, but it also has a kind of respectful embrace of nature. And then I would like to um, come back to the work with the crossbows that relates to this particular video uh, that was uh, that is also one of my first major video is called tropical siesta and we can sh see a, a short clip from this video is a video number four Uh, so in this particular video piece, I um, uh, again I this is the first video piece that I work with children actors, and the actors are um, my relatives and also the children in the village in my husband family farm. In uh, they have a very small coffee farm uh, in the Gia Lai province in the central highlands of Vietnam. So when I came to Zalai province, I was kind of shocked by the kind of uh, destructions that was going on of how pristine forests transform into endless pepper and rubber and coffee plantation. And I also very interested in the educational system that for me, uh, it brings back a kind of nostalgia when I look at the, uh, the school there uh, resemblance the classroom that I went through as um, peop, like, as a student uh, in the 90s and the 2000s in Vietnam the kind of uniform the kind of outfit the kind of imagery that was displayed in the classroom and uh, I used this class classroom as the set for the video piece is called tropical siesta and the content of the video basically explore about the uh, the origin of the origin of chữ quốc ngữ the vietnamese romanized script uh, as many people know vietnam used to be colonized by the chinese for a thousand years and then later on when we got independence we developed another writing system it's called the norm script that borrow chinese characters to depict vietnamese language and until uh, the 17th century, when the missionary came to uh, spread Christianity, they invented with the Vietnamese Catholics, the Vietnamese Romanized script that was later on um, officialized by the French uh, colonizers. And when I came to the Central Highlands, I was kind of intrigued by the fact that um, I came there many times uh, during Muhe San when I came to Dak Lak and this time I stay in Zalai for a longer time and how the children there they are mostly indigenous and they live together with the king ethnic group who actually migrated from the central of the country area like Binh Dinh Nong Nghệ An or like in Dak Lak uh, you can see other ethnic groups like the Mường or the Thai, Thai or the Hmong ethnic group that is actually originally from the uh, northwest of Vietnam but during the reformation period 
they also migrated to the central highlands. So I was surprised that when I was in the art school, I thought that the central highlands should be should look very different. Like you imagine, like the gong or like the the steel houses or like people wearing their traditional outfit, but it's actually it's not. And when I teach the kids there, they are not um, the Jirai or the ethnic, but they are the Moon ethnic. And I was surprised because I thought, oh, you should be in the North, but now you're in the Central. Uh, so I am interested in this kind of uh, very problematic way of dealing about language of how another ethnic group have to study Vietnamese and actually this Vietnamese is also the writing system is invented by a Western effort to uh, uh, colonize or to transform the religion of the local people. And in the video, I borrowed the script from a book by written by uh, by friend uh, Jesuit missionary uh, Alexander Roth who believed to be uh, the, father, the father of Vietnamese Romanized script. Of course, this assumption is very debatable because he, he, has a, a, um, he has a dictionary left. He has a Vietnamese, Latin, and Portuguese dictionary left as a document for people to really see his effort, but other effort by other uh, missionary like Francis the Pina or other Vietnamese uh, uh, Catholics kind of not mentioned because they don't have a physical document to see. So I, I, I got a, a, a book published in uh, 1884, uh, this version, 1884, but the original book was written in the 17th century, in which uh, Rhodes would write about the life in Tonkin and in Kokoshin, uh, north and south of Vietnam at that time, and to see how the life of the Vietnamese people there as pagan and they need to be um, transformed. And um, for the for the uh, uh, for this series, I make a series of watercolor painting that I depict my own imagination on top of the actual book books, and I also talk uh, take sequences from the book content and they become a script for the video for the children actors to reenact. Um, so uh, there are also installation view at Wheels in Brussels and it's just like a kind of an opening scene and for me this kind of bring a kind of nostalgic note because Probably this is the end of the um, how we can perceive an art exhibition where there is a lot of interaction, there is a lot of um, conversation, physical interaction, just right before um, the spread of the pandemic. And it's get very busy, not because of my work, but because of Wurgan Tillman's work, who is a star artist. and His work is extremely beautiful, and I'm very, very lucky to be paired uh, in the in the same period of exhibition with him, and uh, I would like to end the talk by a kind of conceptualized way of thinking about the artwork or the moving image as reincarnations, um, and uh, maybe you can we can see the final video preference.
Um, so I just show an excerpt from an, a 1984 uh, movie. It's called uh, Bao Giờ Cho Đến Tháng Mười uh, or Until October Comes by um, uh, Vietnamese director Đặng Nhật Minh. So uh, in this particular sequence that I show you, it talk about um, a woman who her husband went into war. And because the film was made in the 80s, so I believe this is not the Vietnamese-American war, but maybe other wars that was rarely mentioned in our history, such as the border war with China in 1979, uh, um, in the 70s, or the Vietnamese-Cambodian war in 1979. Um, so basically, the woman didn't hear the news from her husband from the battlefield for a long time, and then she uh, she she dream, uh, and then in the dream she came to a market where she can meet. It's a special market where the people who are alive can meet the people who the key people are the people who pass away. And um, for me, uh, this particular sequence talks a lot about the idea of a moving image or the artworks or cinematic medium or artistic mediums as animate, they have a life and they can have multiple reincarnations. So when you have a cap trauma or tragedy in this life and you have somehow cannot overcome or you find a way to explain it and very naive Vietnamese way uh, for me, uh, as I assume that if I do something wrong in this life, I have to be very good. If not, I would have uh, my next life could be horrible. <laughs> something very simple like that. But of course, this is not as simple. Uh, it's um, it talks about the ability of the artwork to to be able to um, go beyond the surface of the painting or the footage of the video to give alternative. So you even, you believe that it's impossible to meet that person, it is impossible to meet your husband, it's impossible to meet your sister August who passed away during the famine, but somehow there is a method. And the artwork become a method, a medium to encounter these possibilities. And I also paired with other artists' works that very influential to my practice, such as the work of Thai, uh, Thai filmmaker Api Chapon Wirasethakul, who also in one of his films, it's called Uncle Buni, who can recall his past lives, uh, about, a, about a man who basically can remember what his past life was. So his past life, he was uh, a princess, uh, a buffalo, um, a fighter in the jungle, uh, a communist who was very dangerous in Thailand at that time, and also the work of John Jonas, a pioneering performance and video artist who video works uh, explore the relationship between the moving image and its um, Material, materiality, um, and I would like to. I would like to end the. I would like to end the conversation with this slide. Also, I I open the lecture with a poem by Phung Kung, and then I would like to end it with also his poem. And I don't have an English translation here. I think it works better in Vietnamese. And I, I feel that after all of these um, horrific events um, uh, of the pandemic that affects the life of many people, how myself as a visual artist can, can keep going and can keep, can bring um, relevant um, issues um, uh, through the art practice um, that have an artistic but also a social impact. Thank you. So, um, 
uh, we can have a uh, open a little time for question and answer so uh, I receive a, a list of questions so should I should I read the question so the first question you tend to work with multiple mediums and are able to gracefully plant them together. Painterly qualities are embraced in your video works. Interwoving narratives are depicted in your paintings. The audience becomes an actor in your performative installations. What prompts you to work this way? Um, so to answer this question, I think I would um, have share my first interest uh, is with literature, it's not with visual art, because growing up in Vietnam, I have no uh, no contact to visual art. Like I didn't go to museums, I didn't go to gallery. Vietnam in the 90s and the 2000s has a very small art scene and it's very exclusive. And the education doesn't have anything to do with fine art. So I wanted to become a writer uh, at the beginning, but then I realized that oh, I'm not good with writing. Maybe I'm just a little bit better with drawings and painting. And when I came to, to the art school in, in Ho Chi Minh City, which gave me so much resources and it was a beautiful time and I really enjoyed being a painter. But then I realized that um, uh, it doesn't have uh, anything to do with um, with a relationship with uh, what I care about, like history or social issues or um, even art history are not taught in an open way there. So because I have really want to learn and I have so little knowledge about many things that happen, I very interested in giving a very open way of understanding about a subject matter. So I tried to combine videos and paintings and installation and sometimes performances to create an environment. So people, when they enter this environment, it's like, uh, it's like uh, you're reading a fiction. You observe in this work, you know that this is fictional, this is not true, this is personal, but somehow you can have an understanding, you have a compassion with, with the artist. Um, so the second question, children of, often appear in your paintings, in your video works, they act as protagonists. What does it mean for you to borrow their voices to tell a story from the point of view? Um, so to work with children for me is um, very problematic because uh, in a way I can't be intrigued by their innocence and their, and their um, condition of not knowing. And for me, the, this condition of not knowing the truth is just exactly like how I perceive and I think when I started to dive into a project, not knowing anything, just like a child started to learn everything from scratch. But for me, uh, in the video and in the artworks, I do not... Um, I do not... I, I don't think I give voices to the children. Uh, the children are more like a sign or a system of representation in which I would imply my own personal perspective that they become a medium or a carrier to, to perform these actions. So I, I would say that Mm. In a way, it's quite manipulative because I, I don't ask them, well, what do you think? Maybe you can give me your ideas. It's more about me imposing my own perspective 
on the subject matter through the lens of children. Why uh, are you not doing any performances after the one at Get Noi in Singapore? Um, so I think uh, the period when I did performances is, is like um, when you are a student and you are curious and you want to explore everything. So I try performances, installation, video, painting. Um, and I got to know very, very good artists that I admire from that period, such as Li Huan Li, uh, Li Wen, or Chen Lun, or the groups from Nha San, or like Nguyen Huy An. And um, I think it is possible to have uh, multiple practices. You don't have to frame yourself as a performance artist or a painter. So nowadays, we call ourselves visual artists because we believe that, oh, I can work with scientists, I can work with an architect, I can write fiction, I can do videos, I can make paintings, and I am just an artist. And I, I just feel that performance is no longer suitable for me because i just more like an introvert in person and don't want to expose my body to the public. I think it's just a very personal uh, kind of um, realization mm. but I always think that my works are performative you can see that in the video and the paintings and the installation so it doesn't mean that I quit performance with my body it doesn't mean that I stop performative actions in my work um, historically ambiguous and little discussed stories often find their way into your work. Everyday life details we tend to overlook and also included, for example, the Honda Dream motorbike or light decoration we see on the street during set. What inspires you to look for narratives which history tends to want to forget? We also embrace the little things that are specific to our pop culture. Um, so in this question, I, uh, uh, I think there is uh, interest in articulating the, the surrounding everyday, like the pop culture, like the contemporary. Like, um, even though I'm interested in unofficial history, I found that the way to approach these stories uh, could be um, could be misleading because the artwork is not is not uh, the artwork shouldn't be didactic. It shouldn't teach people about anything. The artwork should, for me, it is about emotion and it is about um, a direct have sometimes intuitive feeling uh, between the viewers and the creator. So when I look at an artwork, first I, even though I have read so much and want to know everything, still I want to see the materials, like I want to see what kind of paper the artist used, what kind of paint, the stroke, the texture, um, before I would dive into who is the artist, what kind of historical period the artist is in, what kind of subject matter that the artist is depicting. And I think the magic of the artwork is that it brings a kind of closeness through the material before other things. So, um, so that's why I think the, 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 the inspiration from pop culture it's like how people do art in their everyday practice. Like motorbike, for me, is an art. Like how the Vietnamese culture so engaged with motorbike and engaged with very calm aesthetics, like colorful LED lights. For me, it's so interesting because uh, it's expressed visually um, the dream and the aspiration and the 
uh, and the hope of people for a better life. And those aspirations has so much um, historical and political um, contact. I think I would answer one more question before we ended the conversation. So it's the, if you have one advice for students who want to do art as their profession, what is it? Um, I love to ask for people advices, but for me uh, it's hard because my beginning is also not um, not easy. Like when I, when I was uh, in school, just like the student in Amasi, I have a particular interest in painting. But then my uh, teachers at that time was very discouraging. So like my giáo viên chủ nhiệm, like the head teacher of the class, used to say that, oh, you want to be a painter, so you would be some like people who make who sit next on the Hoàng Kim Lake and then do portrait of people for like um, a few um, hundred Vietnamese dong. And she kind of say with a kind of um, discriminative uh, voice. And I imagine, okay, to be an artist is like you literally have to um, survive every day because it's, it's the, it doesn't have a stable income, it, uh, a job that is not really uh, appreciated by the society, especially in Vietnam. But then I, but then I realized that um, um, there's just so many possibilities and uh, just to just to go with what you are really good at is is probably for me how I found my direction. Because when even in the art school, I'm, I'm not the best painter. I usually being criticized by not doing a good painting, but I don't even know what is a good painting is. So I just really love what I'm doing. So I think very slowly, when you get to know other people that you admire and you learn from them and then you develop um, your personal style, your personal thinking, um, that when things gradually being together, but I have to say that it's really not an easy process. Think, um, so I would like to end the uh, uh, conversation here and uh, thank you everyone online and offline who spend their morning to be with me and if you have further questions please post it on Nguyen Foundation Facebook and then I would follow up. <laughs>